So um, today's topic is going to be tissues. Um, as you'll find out, all organs are actually going to be uh, derived from different types of tissues that have sort of come together uh, to perform a function. And tissues are when you have specialized cells within the body uh, that are either similar cells uh, that come together in structure uh, to perform a common or related function. So here you have a group of cells coming together to actually uh, perform a specific function. Now the study of tissues is referred to as histology. And for those people that are taking the lab, you'll notice that there are uh, several PowerPoint presentations of uh, digital images that look at various uh, tissues throughout the body. Uh, specifically the many different types of tissues that exist. Now out of the many types of tissues that we find in the human body, uh, there are four basic tissue types. You have uh, epithelial tissue. Epithelial tissue is primarily just going to be cells and typically acts as a uh, barrier, a covering. Um, You'll typically find these in the walls of various structures uh, or the linings of various structures. For example, blood vessels will be lined with epithelial tissue. Um, but then the outer layers of your skin are also epithelial tissue. Connective tissue. Uh, this is the second major type of tissue that we find in the body. And with connective tissue, this is going to be involved in support. Uh, support at many different levels. Uh, and this is also the most diverse type of tissue. Uh, you, when we actually go over connective tissues, uh, you'll see that there are many, many different uh, types that sort of fall under the umbrella of connective tissue. Muscle. Muscle tissue is typically involved in movements. And muscle tissue um, is going to uh, there's going to be three main types of muscle tissue. Skeletal muscles, which make up your muscular system and are responsible for physically moving the uh, body itself. Cardiac muscle, which is only found in the heart. And smooth muscle, which is also scattered uh, throughout the body, like skeletal muscle. Uh, but it's an involuntary muscle, and it's typically going to line cavity spaces. Uh, and will support and uh, move uh, within those particular spaces. Nervous tissue is the fourth type of tissue, uh, and nervous tissue is primarily composed of neurons uh, and supporting cells, uh, and is going to uh, primarily work with the uh, nervous system. So here you can see uh, where we typically find uh, different types of tissue scattered throughout the body. You know, we have our nervous tissue here, muscle tissue. Again, we have skeletal, cardiac, and smooth. Epithelial tissue, again, this forms boundaries between different environments. It also protects, secretes, and absorbs, and filters. Okay, and here's some examples. So for example, uh, I mentioned, you know, lining, say, of blood vessels, lining of the digestive tract, uh, your skin surface. These are all epithelial tissues. But also, any gland in your body is considered an epithelial tissue. Okay. And then we have our connective tissues, which is really involved in supporting, protecting, and binding other tissues together. Now, when you look at the microscopy of human tissues, which unfortunately you won't be able to do in person, uh, but we have actually many great images uh, in the uh, various PowerPoints that you're able to view. Uh, and even the atlas that you guys have, um, there's many, many issues there for you to uh, sort of look at as well. Um, when you look at the microscopy of human tissue, uh, in order to view it underneath the microscopes, the tissues must be fixed, which means the tissue has to be preserved with a solvent. It is then sectioned, which means it's cut into slices, 
And these slices need to be thin enough to allow for the transmission of light or electrons. And then finally, it helps to stain the tissues as well. When you stain the tissues, what that does is it helps to enhance the contrast. Um, and that allows it to be able to see these much better. Although artifacts or distortions can distract uh, from what the sample looks like in living tissues. Uh, even the process of fixing the tissues, which is something you have to do anyway, uh, that's actually going to cause some distortions in the actual tissue. Um, whenever you're using a light microscope, uh, that typically will use colored dyes. If you're using electron microscopy, this will use hev heavy metal coatings for your staining. Okay. Uh, and here we can see uh, the trend comparison of uh, transition transmission and scanning electron micrographs. Uh, you're sort of looking at the same specimen here. Here you can see this is a transmission uh, electron micrograph and here's a scanning electron micrograph. So obviously the uh, scanning electron micrograph is going to give you much more uh, detail and more of a 3D uh, view of what you're actually looking at. Okay, so now let's dive into the different types of tissues. We have epithelial tissue. Uh, this is typically a sheet of cells that covers the body surfaces or cavities. Uh, this exists in two main forms, either the covering or the lining epithelial. And these are typically found on external and internal surfaces. And then we have uh, glands or glandular epithelial. These are going to be secretory tissues in glands, for example, salivary glands. The main functions, again, for epithelial tissue are going to be protection, absorption, filtration, excretion, secretion, and sensory reception. Uh, so when you're going through and studying these things, you want to know the general characteristics of the four major types of tissues. And then what we're going to do is we're going to look at each one in more detail. Now, some special features of epithelial tissues is that there are five distinguishing characteristics. One, they exert uh, polarity, okay, or exhibit polarity. What that means is you're going to have a, um, um, what we call an apical surface and a basal surface. And you don't want to use the terms top or bottom, left or right, because if you're thinking about, think about a blood vessel. A blood vessel is a tube, okay? And if you look at, think of a straw, and you look through the straw, the inside of the straw, that whole internal lining of the inside of that straw, if this was the blood vessel, that whole internal lining would be the epithelial tissue, okay? Now the surface that the blood is coming in contact with, we typically call that the apical surface, which is the free surface. And then typically what you'll have is either multiple layers or a single layer of cells below that. And wherever the the stem cells are that sort of uh, produce the epithelial tissue, that is what we refer to as the basal layer. Now, if you think about that uh, straw again, you know, the whole lining inside that tube would be considered the apical surface, and it could be top, bottom, left, or right, okay? So we don't use those terms. But when we describe polarity, we are using apical and basal, and we'll get into that in a little bit more in a few minutes. Uh, there are specialized contacts. Uh, all epithelial tissue will be supported by connective tissues. Uh, epithelial tissue is avascular. What that means is that it does not have uh, blood vessel supply. It gets its nutrients from the underlying connective tissue that all epithelial tissue will have. Uh, although it is avascular, it will be innervated, so it will have nerve supply. Uh, and another key feature of uh, epithelial tissues is that they are highly regenerative. So as I was mentioning with the polarity, cells have polarity. Uh, essentially, if you want to think about it, a top and a bottom, but we don't use those terms to describe that. The apical surface would be the free side. It's, exposed, it's the exposed surface of the cavity, okay? Most apical surfaces are smooth. But in human tissue, we do find some that have finger-like projections, which we call microvilli. 
the microvilli are just invaginations of the plasma membrane surface of the cell. The basal surface, this is the attached side. The attached side is the side that is attached to the underlying connective tissue, or what we'll refer to as the basement membrane. Um, it attaches to the basal lamina, or basement membrane. Uh, I'm sort of dating my age here as far as what this was called, um, which is an adhesive sheet that holds basal surfaces of epithelial tissue to the underlying cells. Uh, both surfaces can differ in their structure. They might look different from each other, uh, and they might even differ in their overall functions. So if we're looking here, you know, here we have an epithelial tissue. Uh, you can see you have a bunch of cells all lined up next to each other. This would be the apical surface here. This is the free surface. This would be our basal surface right here. Okay. Specialized contacts, this is when epithelial tissues need to fit closely together. As I said, these are mostly going to form barriers uh, and you don't wanna have gaps between your cells. So a lot of times epithelial tissue will form continuous sheets. Specialized contact points bind adjacent epithelial tissue. Because they are avascular, which is our next slide, uh, they need to be able to get their nutrients, oxygen, uh, in order to sustain life from the underlying connective tissue. Okay, uh, And we refer to this as the basement membrane. The basement membrane is made up of basal and reticular lamina. It helps to reinforce the epithelial sheet, resist any stretching and tearing, and it defines the epithelial boundaries. As I mentioned, uh, the epithelial tissue is avascular, which means it does not have any blood supply, uh, and any nourishment is by diffusion from any underlying connective tissues. Epithelial tissues are also going to be supplied by nerve fibers. So they are innervated. You do have nerve endings located in your epithelial tissues. And because these tend to be barriers, because they are surface, you know, uh, barriers or they are points of contact with surfaces or exposed surfaces. Um, epithelial tissues are highly regenerative. Um, and they have very high regenerative capacities. They are stimulated by loss of apical basal polarity and broken lateral contacts. That's what stimulates the growth of new cells. Uh, some cells are exposed to friction, some to hostile substances, and this might actually result to damage of the epithelial tissue. And when you do have damage to the epithelial tissue, because it's most likely a barrier protecting from two areas, uh, it must be replaced, okay? And in order to replace these cells, in order to undergo cell division, you do have to have adequate nutrients present as well as the ability to undergo cell division. So what you'll typically find is in those basal layers, you're gonna have lots of stem cells, which will, be able to uh, divide and produce new uh, daughter cells that could be part of the barrier itself. Okay, so when we look at the classification for epithelial tissues, uh, we sort of name it by the number of layers and then we also name it by its shape. Simple epithelia is a single layer of cells, so it's just one layer of cells. Stratified would define anything greater than uh, having uh, two or more layers of uh, cells. Squamous refers to flat cells or flattened cells, cuboidal, cube-shaped, and columnar or column-like. Okay, uh, so we'll look at each of these different types of tissues uh, based on whether they are simple or stratified, as you can see in these two examples here. And again, we have our polarity. So this would be the apical surface here and down here where you see this pink 
purple stuff below is supposed to represent the basement membrane. So this would be our basal surface. Here's the apical surface. And then in our stratified, here's the basal surface down there. And then here's our three basic shapes, either flat cells, cube shape, cube shape cells, or column shape cells. Okay. So uh, what we're going to do uh, now is we're actually going to look at all the different types of epithelial tissue uh, in a little more uh, detail. So the first type of epithelial tissue is going to be simple epithelial. And the first one we're going to talk about is what we call simple squamous epithelium. Now, typically where you would find a single layer of epithelial tissue, the functions involved with that would be absorption, secretion, and filtration. I want you guys to think about these processes. This is where you have things sort of passing through a thin barrier. You don't want to have very thick cells. You really don't want to even have uh, multiple layers of cells for something to pass through. But you want a barrier there to allow some type of selective permeability uh, as far as what can or cannot pass through. So looking at simple squamous epithelium, the cells are flattened laterally and the cytoplasm is pretty sparse. Um, this is going to be especially useful where we have rapid diffusion as a priority. So we will find simple squamous epithelium in our kidneys and lungs, okay? Two special simple squamous epithelia are based on locations. The first is the endothelium. This is the lining of lymphatic vessels, blood vessels, and heart. And the second is mesothelium. This is a serous membrane in the ventral body cavity. Uh, so looking at simple squamous epithelium here, you could see you have a single layer of flat cells. Okay, and what we're actually looking at here, this is actually the alveoli. Alveoli are the air sacs that we find within the lungs. Okay, and here you can see this is the border. Uh, and we can see a nice single layer of flattened cells. Okay. Simple cuboidal, this is a single layer of cells. It is also involved in secretion and absorption. And this is typically gonna be found in the walls of small ducts of glands and many kidney tubules. So this is actually looking at some of those kidney tubules. And if you look here, you can see you have a nice little tubule, okay? And you can see you have a cube cell, cube cell, cube cell, cube cell, cube cell, cube cell, all right, forming that tubule. Now I want to point something out here. This is a tubule. So this, where my arrow is going, this is the apical surface. The lumen of this tubule would all be lined by the apical surface. Here, this is going to be the underlying connective tissue between two tubules here. This is going to be the basal surface. Okay. Simple columnar epithelium. This is a single layer of tall, closely packed cells. Uh, some cells will have microvilli and some cells will have cilia. Some layers will contain mucus secreting goblet cells. So anytime you see the word goblet cells, that means it's a cell that will actually secrete mucus. Simple columnar epithelium is involved in absorption and secretion of mucus, enzymes, and other substances. And uh, some of these cells might even be ciliated. Cilia are actually going to be uh, projections of the cell. Uh, and what happens is the cilia tend to create sort of wave-like movements or motions, uh, which uh, is very good at um, motility of movement of substances. So we'll typically find simple columnar epithelium in the digestive tract, the gallbladder, ducts of some glands, bronchi, and the uterine tubes. And here we have, uh, you know, two surfaces or two uh, simple columnar tissues here. Uh, this looks like an invagination within the uh, intestines here. Uh, and we can see column-like cells all lined up here. This would be the connective tissue underneath here. You can see when you get to the connective tissue, it kind of looks messy. It's not as uniform. Um, so this would be the basal surface down here, okay? This would be our apical surface here. But on this tissue, this is the apical surface here. And then our basal surface would be here, okay? And if you look, you can see it looks a little hazy at the end here. You can see the dark staining line. Um, 
this particular type of simple form there is actually ciliated. Okay. Um, uh, and I'm so sorry, not ciliated. Uh, it has microvilli projections. Okay. Um, pseudostratified columnar epithelium. These cells will vary in height and they appear to be multi-layered and stratified. But tissue is in fact a single layer of simple epithelium. So this type of tissue appears to look like it has multiple layers, but actually all the cells don't reach the apical surface. Uh, and it gives a multi-layered appearance. Uh, these are actually a single layer. Um, cells can be ciliated as well. Uh, these are mostly located in the upper respiratory tract, ducts of large glands, and the tubules of the testes. And here you can see, uh, it looks like multiple layers, but if you note, not all of these cells actually reach the apical surface here. So if you look at this guy here, it doesn't quite make it all the way up top. Uh, this one sort of squeezes up to about here, but they all originate at the basal surface, not actually make it all the way up to the top. Not all of them. Uh, what you're looking at here, these are the cilia. These are going to be much longer extensions compared to the microvilli. Okay. Okay. So next up is going to be our stratified epithelial tissues. And again, just what stratified means is it involves two or more layers of cells. Uh, this is the new cells will regenerate to form, uh, will regenerate from cells that are below or cells that are in the basal surface. Uh, stratified squamous epithelium tends to be much more durable than simple epithelia because protection is the major role of this type of tissue. So the first one is stratified squamous epithelium. This is the most widespread of the stratified epithelia. The free surface is squamous typically with deeper cuboidal or columnar layers. So as you get to the basal layer, you're gonna see more healthier hardier looking cells, but as you get to the apical surface, you'll start to see these flatten out. Uh, and you'll definitely see this when we talk about the skin uh, with our next chapter. Um, you know, when you look at the skin, uh, you'll see those outer layers, it's not even really cells anymore. They're essentially just membrane sacs that have been filled with protein called keratin. Uh, which brings up the next and final point of this slide, which is keratinized cells. Uh, keratinized cells just means that they are filled up with that protein called keratin. So if you look here, you can see, you know, here's our uh, basal surface here, but as you start to see and get towards these outer layers, they don't even really look like cells anymore. It's just kind of, uh, you know, layers. Uh, stratified cuboidal epithelium, this is quite rare. Uh, it's found in some sweat and mammary glands uh, and typically only two to two cell layers thick. Um, the stratified columnar epithelium, this is also very limited throughout the body. Uh, small amounts are found in the pharynx, uh, in the male urethra, and the lining of some glandular ducts. Uh, this usually occurs at the transition areas between two other types of epithelium and only apical layer is columnar, okay? Uh, your atlas does have uh, pictures of these two rare types that we find throughout the body. Finally, there is what we call transitional epithelium. Transitional epithelium forms the lining of hollow urinary organs. So this is actually a tissue that's going to be uh, system specific. You're only really gonna find this type of tissue in the urinary system. Uh, you'll find this tissue lining the bladder, the ureters, and the urethra. And the reason is, is that the, the structure of the transitional epithelium is to allow for expansion of the tissue. And what happens is your bladder expands as it fills up. Same thing when you're urinating, uh, the ureters, I'm sorry, the, the urethra will expand out as urine is flowing through. But even the ureters will expand as you know urine travels from the kidneys to the bladder for storage. Uh, and typically what you have are gonna be nice cuboidal cells at the basal layer and then these dome-shaped cells at the apical layer. Okay, that's typically what we see as the uh, structure for this transitional epithelium.
Okay, so the second type of epithelial tissue is going to be glands. And glands are one or more cells that make and secrete an aqueous fluid called a secretion. These are classified by the site of the product that's released, whether it's an endocrine gland or an exocrine gland. Endocrine glands are internally secreting and endocrine glands will secrete chemical messengers that ultimately get circulated throughout the entire body, most likely through the bloodstream. Exocrine glands, these are externally secreting, and these are going to be glands that typically secrete either into a cavity or on the surface. Um, and an exocrine gland would be a, a local secretion. It's not something that does travel throughout the whole body. The relative number of cells forming of glands uh, is also something that we classify them by. They may either be unicellular or multicellular. Um, so here you can see uh, different types of uh, glands. Okay, here we have, um, you know, an epithelial sheet that gets invaginated. Okay. Uh, and then, you know, you sort of have this little uh, production and duct for your exocrine glands, for endocrine glands. You're going to have capillaries that sort of surround the endocrine glands. Uh, as I mentioned, these are chemical messengers that will actually uh, secrete their uh, products into the bloodstream. And the bloodstream will then transport uh, these chemical messengers, which we refer to as hormones, uh, throughout the body. So endocrine glands are ductless glands. Uh, the secretions are not released into a duct. They are released into the surrounding interstitial fluid, which is picked up by the circulatory system. They secrete by exocytosis hormones. Exocytosis is a mechanism of uh, removing things from a cell by a vesicle. These messenger chemicals uh, will then travel through the lymph or the blood to their specific target organs. And when we get to the endocrine system, we'll talk about what defines a target organ. It's going to be an organ that actually has a receptor for that particular type of hormone. Exocrine glands, these are secretions that are released onto body surfaces such as skin or into the body cavities. Uh, exocrine glands are more numerous than endocrine glands. They secrete their products into ducts. And examples would include mucus, sweat, oil, salivary glands. These can either be unicellular or multicellular. Uh, all uh, endocrine glands will be uh, multicellular. Forgot to mention that on the prior slide. Um, exocrine glands typically are what we refer to as localized uh, secretions. Um, unicellular exocrine glands, the only important unicellular exocrine gland exocrine gland are mucus cells or goblet cells, uh, and they secrete mucus. Okay, uh, here's an example of one of those goblet cells, and here you can see the secretary uh, vesicles containing mucin, uh, and what happens is, you know, through exocytosis, they release their secretions onto a surface. Your multicellular exocrine glands, uh, these are composed of a duct and a secretary unit. Uh, they are usually surrounded by supportive connective tissue that supplies blood and nerve fibers to the glands. The connective tissue can also form a capsule around the glands and also extend into the gland and can actually divide that gland into multiple lobes. Uh, these multicellular exocrine glands are classified by their structure and actually the mechanism or mode of their secretion. So if we look at their structure, we have a simple exocrine gland. These have unbranched ducts, um, but your compound glands will have branched ducts, okay? In a tubular gland, the secretory cells will form a duct, whereas in an alveolar gland, they will form sacs. Uh, and you'll see the term alveolar, av, that term actually means sac, okay? Uh, you'll see that term again when we get to the lungs and we talk about the alveoli in the lungs or the air sacs. Um, so here you can see simple versus compounds, uh, tubular versus alveolar, uh, the structure of these different types of glands. Now as far as mode of secretion, 
uh, merocrine glands, these are going to secrete products by exocytosis as secretions are produced. Halocrine glands, these will accumulate products within and then rupture, causing the release of the secretions. And then finally, apocrine glands, these will accumulate products uh, within, but only the apex will rupture, okay? Whether this type exists in humans is controversial. Uh, some people believe that mammary cells behave in this manner, um, but really in the human body, we really see merocrine or uh, holocrine. And this is just an example of those two types of tissues. Okay. And that's where I'm gonna end for recording number one of tissues. We'll pick up with connective tissues for recording number two.